Deuteronomy chapter 12, we can uh, pray and start looking at it. Uh, isn't it nice that it's been warming up? Man, it's like 45 degrees, and it's like, mm, I've been, uh, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, that is going to be an issue for a while, yeah, for sure. I, uh, yeah, it'll be muddy for probably the month of March, I bet, yeah. I've uh, been able since Sunday to be riding my bike every day, um, well, about 10 miles, and my goal this year is to ride at 2,000 miles, so I only have 1,969 miles to go to reach my goal. So that's exciting, um, but it's great to be able to be doing that. But let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll look at this. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for uh, today. Uh, Lord, thank you for the weather, Lord, that it is warming up. Um, Lord, even just this evening when I came up the stairs before the study, I was looking outside as the sun was setting, Lord, and it's just a, a beautiful sky, Lord, and, and the mountains are white, and it's just a, a great place to live, God. So thank you that uh, you've blessed us, Lord, to be able to live, um, Lord, in this valley, and um, Lord, just to see your, your creation and your handiwork, and um, God, I just pray that tonight as we look at these two chapters uh, dealing with uh, worshiping you and also dealing with false prophets. Um, God, I just ask that you would speak through me, um, that we would learn uh, some good stuff, Lord, tonight, that you would just speak to us, God, that your spirit uh, would bear witness with our spirit, God, the things that are true. Um, Lord, we just pray for those uh, in our fellowship that are uh, struggling, God. Um, there's sickness, there's uh, aching, there's all sorts of stuff, Lord, that people are dealing with. So we just ask that you would just be with them and comfort them. Um, Lord, thank you that you are, uh, that you described yourself in your word, Lord, as um, the God of all comfort, God. That's a, that's a good thing to know that that's who you are. Um, so thank you for that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you guys remember last week, we just uh, covered one chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Uh, we saw... Uh, Kind of the overarching thing was this idea of obedience and love, and the reason why we should obey the Lord is because we love Him, and it is that order. Um, because we understand that God loves us, we are able to love Him, and because we are able to love Him, the way that we can express the love that we have towards God is by obeying Him, is by doing what He says. And we wrapped things up last week uh, with a, a really interesting point as Moses lays out for the children of Israel uh, this beautiful picture. He says, you all have a choice to make, and God sets before you a choice this day. Obedience or disobedience, blessing or or curse. And he actually, the Lord uses these two mountains there in Israel to describe this. He says, you got Mount Gerizim and you got Mount Ebal. Mount Gerizim is the Mount of Blessing. Mount Ebal is the Mount of Cursing. If you're obedient, uh, you get the mountain of blessing. If you're disobedient, you get the mount of cursing. But we saw that's true for Israel in the Old Testament. But as New Testament believers, um, God has a bit of a different covenant with us. Um, yes, it's true that when we obey God, we still get blessed, but we saw in the book of Joshua chapter 9 last week that on that mount of cursing, Mount Ebal, Joshua built an altar on the mount of cursing, not on the mount of blessing, on the mount of cursing, and he built an altar there as a provision, as a means that when we in our life find ourselves disobeying God because it happens as Christians. We are going to backslide. We are going to uh, give into the flesh. We are going to find ourselves sinning. There's provision for us on the Mount of Cursing. We don't have to be cursed because Jesus Christ, the book of Galatians tells us, was a curse for us. Um, and that's very good news for us. As we pick it up here in chapter 12, um, we're going to see God kind of lay out for his people how a worship is supposed to happen. So in chapter 12, verse 1, he says this. Um, These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord your God, which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. So he just yet again reminds them, which the book of Deuteronomy is a constant reminder about what's already happened in uh, Leviticus and Numbers, essentially. It's kind of a recap. And he's reminding them again, when I bring you into the land, you need to be careful. And I like that word that he uses there. He says, be careful that you observe the things that I've told you. When you finally get into the promised land, be careful that you're obedient. Be careful in your walk with me. Uh, essentially, he's saying, don't be sloppy when you walk with me. 
And sometimes it's easy for us to be sloppy in our walk with God. But he says, no, 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 I want you to be careful. I want you to be intentional. I want it to be something that you're thinking about on a daily basis. It's not just something you put on autopilot. It's something you need to be careful in doing, and you need to be conscious of your obedience towards me. Verse 2, he says, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess uh, and uh, serve their gods on the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree. He says, I want you to utterly destroy the pagan practices of the nations that are currently living in the promised land. You see, the land of Israel, which God is going to lead his people into in the book of Joshua, is already occupied. It's got some people living in it already, and they're pagan uh, cultures. They're very religious people, but they practice false religion. So he says, when you move into this new land, I don't want you to just integrate into what they're doing. He says, I want you to get rid of what they're doing so that you can keep doing what I want you to do. Notice how he says there in verse number two, he says, I want you to utterly destroy whatever they have. I just want you to get rid of it. He doesn't say, I want you to set it to the side. I want you to keep it in storage because you might be able to use it for something else. No, he says, I want you to utterly, completely destroy it. Just get rid of it so that no matter what happens, you cannot fall into uh, the trap of wanting to worship as the way uh, that the Canaanites or, or whoever it might be that they're dealing with there in the land of Israel. Just just get rid of it. Now, for us today, uh, we don't deal with idolatry like they did back then. Most people don't worship idols and, and stuff like that as far as carved images. Um, but the reality is an idol for us today is anything that comes between our soul and God. Whatever becomes between you and God, that has become an idol. And he says there that, that you should utterly destroy it. So in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, Paul says this about us. He says that you put off concerning the former conduct and the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And the same way that they were to utterly destroy the altars and the idols of the pagans, Paul says we are to put off our old man, who we were before Jesus, so that we could be clothed in the new man, who we are after being born again, after our encounter with Jesus. Verse 3 goes on to say there in Deuteronomy chapter 12, And you shall destroy the altars, break their sacred pillars, and you shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. Now, this is very um, interesting for us to read in our culture because as Americans, we have a law, and for our country, it's a good law for the most part, but, but we believe in freedom of religion, that people can express their religious views how they want. God does not believe in freedom of religion. God believes that you should worship the one and true God, and that's it. He's not an all for whoever wants to do whatever they want. I'm cool with that. God goes, no, 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 no. So sometimes in our American culture, when we read this, we go, wow, God, he doesn't seem real tolerant. But here's the deal. If you're the God who created everyone, uh, you're the God who's trying to redeem your people, and you have this group of people that's um, ignoring you as the true God and just worshiping created stuff, that's offensive to him. He doesn't put up with that stuff. So he says, you just need to get rid of it. It reminds me of what Paul dealt with in the book of Acts chapter 19, verse 19. Paul is in Ephesus and he's teaching, uh, sharing the gospel there in Ephesus. And as he's doing that, um, there's some uh, demon possession issues actually that are going on and uh, so much so that like these demons mess with these guys and they run out of their house hurt and naked and everyone in the in the uh, city is like freaking out anyway paul shares with them the gospel they get saved and as a result of this these uh people in ephesus that were into kind of occultic stuff, it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 19, it says, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all that they, 
that they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. These people get saved. They have an experience with Jesus. They got this stuff from their past life, these books of magic. Those are not valuable anymore now that you know the Lord. They're actually an abomination to him. And even though they're valuable in the sight of the world, 50,000 pieces of silver, they choose to throw them into the fire and just get rid of them instead of holding on to them. And this is the kind of radical stuff that God um, kind of calls his people to. He wants us to kind of be all in for him and not have distractions around us. Verse 4, he says, You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. This verse proves to us, as others, that, and a lot of Christians get confused on this, but you cannot worship God on your own terms, okay? you got to worship God how he tells you to worship him. And there's kind of a mindset today, even in Christianity, that, that's like, well, I, I kind of, I worship God in my own way. And I understand kind of what people mean by that, but if you take that too far, you're going to get into trouble. There's certain ways that God says you're to worship me. There's certain ways he says that you're not to worship me. Let's see if we can find out a little bit more about that. Verse 5, he says, But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. My people, he says, I want you, when you get into the new land, to seek for, to look for the place, the physical location, that I'm going to set up for you to worship me. You see, God wanted a certain place for his people to come together and worship him. He would use Shechem, um, he'll use um, Shiloh. Ultimately, he's going to use Jerusalem, as we know, as that central place for his people to come and worship. So he says, I want you to be seeking. I want you to be in tune with me. I want you to be looking for that place that I'm going to establish, and that is how I want you to worship me. I want you to come to this place to worship me. Why would God want to bring his people to a central place in order to worship him? One reason is because it would cut back on um, idolatry. If everyone has to come to the same place to worship, everyone's going to be worshiping similarly, and you're not going to have these fringe people in the back of their house building these altars and these idols trying to worship um, Yahweh in a pagan way. So he says, to avoid that weird stuff going on on the side, I want you all to come together in a, this location to worship me. Verse 6, he goes, therefore you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes that you have brought or that you have in the heave offerings uh, of your hands and your vowed offerings and your freewill offerings and your firstborn of the flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice in all uh, to which you have put your hand and you and your household in which the Lord your God has blessed you. This place that I'm going to establish, ultimately Jerusalem, that's where you're going to bring all your sacrifices, all your offerings. That is where the tabernacle will ultimately be set up. That is where the temple will finally be built later on in the Old Testament. He says, that's the place where I want you to go. Now, I find this interesting here in Deuteronomy chapter 12 as we're talking about places of worship. Because in the New Testament, in John chapter 4, Jesus has a discussion with a woman at the well about places of worship. You see, Jesus has been uh, ministering for quite a while, and uh, he's in a pretty dry area, and he's thirsty, and his disciples go off to the city to get some food, so he decides in the middle of the day that he's going to go get a drink from a well. And it says um, in John chapter 4, verse 4, but he, being Jesus, needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of, of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph back in the book of Genesis. Now, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, can you give me a drink? Verse 8, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria did to him how, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me and he, and he would have given you living water. 
Then the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Hey, here's this lady. She's going to get her daily water. Jesus comes up to the well. Um, since you got your bucket and you're fetching water anyway, Jesus goes, could you get me a, a bucket of water to drink? Sure. And she goes, uh, what are you as a Jew talking to me as a Samaritan? That wouldn't be kosher back then. It was a, they didn't get along at all. Jesus goes, lady, you don't get it. He goes, look, if you knew who I was right now who's asking you for a drink, you would actually be asking me for a drink because I can give you living water. And we'll get to that in a little bit. She goes, you can't get me water. She goes, you don't have anything to get down into the well and get water with. She's thinking physical. Jesus is talking spiritual. Verse 12, it says, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. You're promising me that you can give me water that's going to cause me to not thirst anymore. Not only will I not thirst anymore, but water's going to shoot forth out of me. She goes, this is a great opportunity for me to get rid of my chore. She goes, I got to come here every day. So she's still thinking physical, and she goes, Jesus, hook me up with this stuff. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, this is where it gets interesting. Go call your husband <laughs> and come here, have him come here. And the woman said uh, to him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you've said, well, I have no husband, for you've actually had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. And then verse 19, she, it says, the woman said to him, sir, um, I perceive that you're a prophet. All of a sudden, she realizes this guy's special, right? He's got some insight that she didn't realize. Verse 20, um, our fathers, she asked him a question, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Remember our context in Deuteronomy chapter 12, God has set up a place to worship. Her question is, uh, where should it be, on our mountain or in Jerusalem, where the Jews say? And Jesus says to her in verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on that mountain or in Jerusalem, but you will worship the Father and you worship what you do not know, and we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, you're looking at him. Not quite. He said, I am, I am, I, I who speak to you am he. But in the Hagen Miller translation, he says, here I am, right? So here she has this conversation and eventually gets to where is the correct place to worship since you're a spiritual guy. He goes, actually, um, it's neither of those places anymore. Jesus goes, now that I've come onto the scene, the place where God is going to receive worship is from those who worship him in both spirit and in truth. So for us as New Testament believers, where is the place where God has called us to worship him? Right. And now let me say it this way. Who is the place where God has called us to worship him? Jesus, okay? It's still the same. There's only one place where God receives worship from his people, and that's through his son. Any other way is unacceptable to the Lord. Any other way he does not recognize, it's only through Jesus that he receives worship. Um, so he says, man, I'm going to set up a place for my people where they can come together. Ultimately, it's through Jesus, but we see that today demonstrated in the church. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, Paul says, I want you guys to be stirring up in each other the giftings that you have. And then he says in verse 25, do not neglect the assembling together of the brethren. He says, I don't want you to think it's not a big deal to not come together with believers. 
Again, this is another issue that we face in our society today because people say, well, my church is the golf course or my church is out on the mountain. That's where I really connect with God. And I agree to a certain extent. I can really connect with God when I'm hiking or riding my bike or riding my horse or whatever. But church is not just about feeling close to God. It's about being with each other. And that's why Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews makes it clear that it's important for us to come together. And as the church, when we come together, there are three things that we should be ultimately doing. Church should be a school, a place where we learn about the things of God. And we do a pretty good job of that, I think, of just really digging into the, the, the Bible and seeing what God has to say. Church should be like a school. Church should also be like a gym, though. It should be a place where we can exercise the gifts that God has given us, and we can be working out the things in our life that God is. Uh, equipped us with. It needs to be like a school where we're learning about him and his word. It needs to be like a gym where the things that he's equipped us with we're working out. And lastly, it needs to be like a hospital, a place where we can come and receive healing, a place where broken people can come in through the doors and have a connection with the Lord and experience the God who is the uh, God of uh, healing. And that's not just speaking physically necessarily, but it can be, but also just uh, spiritually and emotionally and all the levels that we as human beings have. So uh, God makes it clear even back in the Old Testament, here's my point, that it's important to come together. And ultimately, the true place where we're to worship as Christians is through the Son. But the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us we cannot forsake the assembling together, uh, the thing that we call church. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 7, he says, And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all which you have put your hand And your household in which the Lord your God has blessed you. And you shall not at all do as we are doing here today. Which is, every man doing what is right in his own eyes. Now this is something that we really face today in our culture. This is the most popular thing on college campuses today is this philosophy. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. It's this idea of moral relativism, that that there is no absolute truth, that as long as I'm comfortable with it and I can sleep okay at night, then it must be morally right. And if I disagree with some sort of greater moral standard, uh, that's okay because I set the standard. And it's a dangerous road to walk down. Later on in the Bible, in Judges chapter 17, verse number 6, they fall into this trap when they're dealing with rulers and stuff. And it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's a problem. Why? Because when what's right in my eyes is different than what's right in your eyes, how do we know what's actually right? There has to be a moral absolute There has to be morality that transcends us, that came from something greater than us to establish what truly is right or wrong. And God says, man, you got to be careful of this mindset. Verse number nine says, for as yet you have not come to the rest, as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But, verse 10, he says, when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit, and he gives you the rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in it safely, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice offerings, which you have vowed to the Lord. He kind of repeats himself there, but he says, once you cross over the Jordan, you get into the promised land, then you will have the rest that I've been promising you. Your enemies won't bother you. Um, That's only true if they kind of do what he says, if they utterly destroy, and they did not do that. As a matter of fact, this is kind of a side note, but notice how he says back there in verse... um, four or five, maybe it's verse three. Anyway, he talks about destroy everything on their high places. Destroy because they would go up on the the mountains and they would have their pagan worship. Israel was told, get rid of this stuff. And they didn't do it. And as a result, it's going to create a lot of drama for them later on in the Old Testament. Now, even in our modern history, during the six-day war, Israel takes over the Temple Mount and they could have easily got rid of um, 
the Islamic influence that was there and overtaken the Dome of the Rock and the Al Aqsa Mosque, and they ha- they flew an Israeli flag above uh, the Temple Mount, and they could have taken control in that moment. Yet for some reason, and it doesn't make any sense militarily, they they, they said to uh, the Palestinians, "Here's the deal: we could have taken this from you. We didn't. Instead." Um, we're going to make a peace treaty with you and always know in the back of your mind that we could have did this, but we didn't. And they were hoping that that would influence peace in the Middle East and ultimately it didn't. But my point is over and over and over again, Israel um, didn't obey this commandment and it's created uh, tensions even today in the Middle East. Verse number um, Uh, 12 says, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and your female servants, and the Levites uh, who is within your gates, since he has no no portion uh, nor inheritance with you. I like how he says there in verse number 12, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. I think three times in this chapter, he commands his people to rejoice. He says, I want you to be excited. God wants his people to be happy people. We should find comfort in knowing that. God wants us to be joyful people. He wants us to be rejoicing. Paul would say in Philippians chapter uh, 4, verse number 4, he would say, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. When does Paul write this? When he's in a Roman prison cell. Cell. Now, this is interesting because the Roman prisons were not like the Lemhi County bed and breakfast up on the Bar Hill, okay? These were very, very bad situations that Paul finds himself in, yet even in a very uh, tough physical situation where he would be neglected uh, physically and not get the nutrition that he needs, he's encouraging the church in Philippi to rejoice in whatever circumstance they might find themselves in. It's always been on the heart of God for his people to be joyous people. And sometimes, um, I think it was either Spurgeon or Moody, but I'm pretty sure it was Spurgeon said, you know, sometimes it appears that Christians are at a, uh, like a, 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 he didn't use the word funeral. I can't remember the quote exactly, but he goes, it's just sad when... Some, they call them the sour saints. How come Christians seem to be this like, and, and we think we got to be so reverent and stiff nosed and like proper. And it's like, no, 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 no. God's people are supposed to be happy and rejoicing. And we just see that reminder here in verse number 12. Verse 13, it says, take heed to yourselves that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chose uh, in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings And there you shall do all that I commanded you. You can't just be making sacrifices wherever you want. You have to do it in the place that I command you. Ultimately, it'll be Jerusalem. Verse 15, this is a great verse. I have it highlighted, actually. He says, however, you may slaughter, you can butcher, when it's not sacrificial, when you're just butchering and eating, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates, whatever your heart desires. Man, this is a good verse for carnivores in the room, right? When it comes to eating meat, though, he says, you can eat as much of it as you want, and you can do that wherever you want. Sacrificial has to be done in Jerusalem. If you just want to eat a nice steak, he says, you can eat that wherever, and you can eat as much as your heart desires. So look, do I spiritually have a problem uh, with people who choose to be vegetarians? Mm, Kind of, right? (laughs) I'm kidding, no. But... It's okay for us spiritually to eat meat. God says it over and over and over again. Uh, uh, Whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you, the unclean and the clean. He's not talking about the animals. He's talking about the eater, the people. The unclean and the clean may eat of it, uh, of the gazelle, of the deer alike. Only, he says in verse 16, here's the only thing you can't do. You shall not eat the blood. No medium rare. (laughs) You shall pour it on the earth like water. This reminds us of what God told his people back in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, when he was talking about blood. This is why they couldn't eat the blood. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. You can't eat the blood because the blood is the... um, instrument that I'm using to show you guys atonement. He says, so I can't have you consuming it because I use that on the altar to show you what redemption looks like. He says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. 
Now, this is interesting because as he's encouraging them there in verse number 16 to not uh, eat or drink the blood of the animals, he's discouraging them away from pagan practices. Because again, back then in that culture, the pagans believed that if they would drink the blood of an animal, that they would take on the characteristics of the blood of the animal that they drank. For example, if they needed strength, they would drink the blood of an ox, and they think they would get strength. If they wanted speed, they would drink the blood of a gazelle, and they would think they would take on that characteristic. Now, as I was thinking about this this week, I thought that's interesting that the pagans thought if you partook of the blood of something, you took on its characteristic. Because Jesus taught us in the New Testament, when he said, take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood. When we, when we partake of him, we actually take on his characteristic, his holiness. And I just find that parallel kind of fascinating, that, that they had this false idea. But the truth is, is that there's underlying truth. When we partake of Jesus, we receive his characteristic and his characteristic is that of holiness. Verse 17, he says, You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine or your oil of the firstborn of your herd or your flock or of any of your offerings which you vow of your free will offering or of the heave offering. You can't eat your offerings anywhere. Those have to be done, again, at the special place. Verse 18, But you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God has chosen, and your sons and your daughters, your male and your female servants, and uh, the Levites who is within the gates, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all uh, to which you put your hands to. Verse 19, take heed to yourselves that you do not forsake the Levites as long as you live in your land. Don't forget about those Levites. They don't have an inheritance, so take care of them, he says. Verse 20, when the Lord your God enlarges your borders as he has promised you, and you say, let me eat meat because uh, you long to eat meat, you may eat as much meat as your heart desires. Again, this chapter repeats itself a few times, and I'm okay with verse 20 being repeated uh, again, like verse 15. And look, if your heart wants meat, he says, you go out and you have meat. Verse 21, if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, let's say you live a long way away from Jerusalem, then you may slaughter from your herd and from the flock which the Lord has given you, just as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your gates uh, as much as your heart desires. Just as the gazelle and the deer are eaten, so you may eat them. The unclean and the clean alike, you may eat them. Verse 23, only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life, uh, in the blood is the life, and you may not eat the life which is in the meat. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it on the earth like water. You shall not eat it uh, that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Only the holy things which you have uh, and your vowed offerings you shall take and go to the place which the Lord has chosen. And you shall offer your burnt offering, the meat and the blood on the altar that the Lord your God, and the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all the words which I have commanded you, that it may go well with you. Notice what happens when we observe and obey. Things go well for us. It sounds like a pretty simple point, but we need to be reminded of that a lot. Observe and obey all the words which I have commanded you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. Three different times he kind of runs through the same points. I got a special place I want you to worship at. I don't want you worshiping in other places. Uh, I want you to be rejoicing when you come before me and worship. And it's like, man, God, why do you repeat yourself three times in this one chapter? Well, because he's dealing, what are the children of Israel called? Children of Israel. And if you've ever been a parent or dealt with kids, how many parents have ever said to their kids, how many times do I have to tell you? You should never say that to your kids because you should tell them at least one more time, okay? So it's like you should just expect it by this point, and God knows that. So he goes, I'm just going to really drill it in in this chapter and be sure we're all on the same page. Verse 29, he says, When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourselves that you are not ensnared to follow them. After 
uh, they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. God is going to help his people out. He's going to cut off the nations. But he says, when I do my part of cutting them off, don't go chasing after what I've cut off. Sometimes we like to do that. Sometimes God will slam a door in our face and we'll go around and crawl through the window. And then we'll wonder why, we got our, why God allowed us to get into this situation. And God goes, look, dude, I slammed it right in your face and you break a window to try to keep going with what you think is right. He goes, don't do it. If God cuts something off, don't chase after it. He, he goes, don't do that. He goes in verse number 30. This is interesting. He says, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You know, um, ignorance can be a good thing. And he says, when it comes to the pagan practices, don't even be curious about it. He says, don't even look into that stuff. You really don't need to be studying these things. He, he says, it can just be a snare. So he goes, don't, don't worry about how all these other people are worshiping their false gods. He says, I want you to focus in on how you're supposed to be worshiping me, uh, the, the true God. Verse number 31, he says, you shall not worship the abomination uh, to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods, for they burned even their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. This is a reference to the god of Moloch that they had back then, a Lucia brass or bronze uh, guy with his arms stretched out, and they would put him in fire and heat him up, and the pagans would put their babies, their children, on the arms of the God of Moloch as a sacrifice. And God goes, this is an abomination to me. He says, it doesn't impress me one bit. Verse 32, he says, whatever I commanded you, be careful to observe it, and you shall not add to it, nor take away from it. You know, because that's what we like to do as humans. God gives us, here's what I want from you. We go, okay, this is God's standard. Let me add a little bit of this. Let me take this thing away and kind of make it my own. He goes, no, 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 no. Here's what I want from you. Do not add to it. Do not take away from it. Just walk in what I've told you to do. You see, the safest place for you and me to be is obedient to God. Not adding to it, not taking away from it. Just simply doing what he's told us to do. Awesome. Verse number thir or chapter 13, we got some time here, which is good, because we're going to now talk about false prophets. Chapter 13, verse 1, he says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of this prophet or this dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. He says, let's say, for instance, back in verse 1, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, this guy shows up one day. Here's how we could say it in our culture. Let's say someone arises. Let's say you're on the TV. You hear something on the radio. Uh, you're, you're, you're visiting a church. Someone comes knocking on your door, and they claim to be a, a prophet, a dreamer of dreams. They claim to have authority a speaker of truth. He goes, here's what you need to do with that person. If they arise among you, a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, verse 2 makes it interesting, and the sign and wonder comes to pass. These guys aren't just full of it. They're not just moving their lips. He goes, they say they're going to do a miracle, and the miracle actually happens. Now, this would impress most of us, but he goes, don't be impressed with what you see, he says, you need to listen to the message that they're bringing. He says, if this person comes, if this guy on TV is doing awesome stuff, and it's like, whoa, this is the miraculous, but he's saying in some underlying way, follow a different God. He says, essentially, the Lord says, run. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams is even doing signs and wonders, but they try to get you away from Jesus and onto something else, 
You need to run away from that situation as fast as possible. Throughout the New Testament, over and over and over again, we have warnings about false prophets and false teachers in the church because the Lord knew that this would be an issue that we would be facing until uh, he comes back and gets us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted you may uh, you may well put up with it he goes here's my concern and he says it again in galatians chapter one if myself or even an angel from heaven comes and preaches another gospel to you than that which has already been preached paul says in galatians chapter one let him be accursed because in case you were sleeping or you weren't paying attention, I'm going to say it one more time in Galatians chapter 1. He repeats himself again. He goes, again, if me or an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel than that which you've heard, let them be accursed or anathema, literally damned. And 1 Corinthians there, or second, where was I just at? Second, yeah, second Corinthians chapter 11, as Paul is talking to them, he says, watch out for people who might bring a, another Jesus or another gospel to you. Because Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, that these false prophets, these false teachers are going to be like wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to look the part. They're going to act the part. They might even talk the part. But when you actually sit down and have a conversation, you realize you're talking about very different things. You see, most false teachers, especially in our community, Um, We have the same vocabulary, but we have different dictionaries, okay? We use the same words, but we have very different meanings. If someone came up to me and they said, um, do you know Evan Stice? I said, sure, I know Evan Stice. He's a pretty cool guy. They go, yeah, isn't he pretty cool? I mean, he's, he's six foot tall, and he's a 300-pound black man. Evan Stice is a cool guy. I go, well, the Evan Stice I know is about this big, and he's an up-and-coming motocross guy. I don't think we're talking about the same guy. Oh, no, no, Evan Stice, it's the same one. No, I'm pretty sure we're talking about two different people. Just because someone uses the name Jesus doesn't mean they're talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Well, maybe even our church has the name Jesus in it. Well, let's talk about who Jesus is. Is he God? Has he been created or has he always existed? Is he, and you start working through these things and all of a sudden you realize we're both using the name Jesus, but the Jesus that I'm talking about out of here seems to be pretty different than the Jesus that you're saying that you believe in. So Paul says, man, you got to be careful about this stuff because you look at it. And they're, they're, they're well, man, well, they got great programs, and they're really good with family, and they're clean shaved, and all these things that look really good. But he goes, you got to see what they're saying. Are they leading you to follow a different God? And um, let's see. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, John warns about false teachers as well, verses 1 through 3. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already on the scene. He says, you got to be careful. You got to test what you're hearing. You need to be like the Bereans. In uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says this on this idea of seeing a sign and maybe being deceived. 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. I actually might not have this one marked. 
Anyway, he's talking about the Antichrist in the context, and he says the day is coming, the Antichrist is coming to come onto the scene. He's going to have lying signs and wonders. My point is, is that God's not the only one who has power in the supernatural realm. He's the only one who has ultimate power, but Satan can do what looks like on our end of things, miraculous stuff, and he'll try to use it to deceive us. So back in Deuteronomy in the New Testament, God warns his people, you got to be careful. You don't get sucked into this trap because it can't just be about what you're seeing you got to be hearing the message that they're bringing. And if they try to lead you away to another God, anything else besides the Jesus of the New Testament, you got to flee from that situation. Um, verse uh, 3, I guess he says, You shall not listen to a, the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Now, God is not testing you for him to find out. He's testing you for you to find out, right? He says, hey, this is for you to know where you're at with me. Verse four, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. Man, he just, your solution here in this situation, just stay close to what you know. Stay close to what you know is true. Keep your face in this book. Keep reading. Keep studying. Keep praying. Keep holding on to the Lord, and don't worry about what's going on with these other groups or whatever. Verse 5, he says, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to end to... Um, entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall put away the evil from your midst. Now, this is a law for is the nation Israel. This is not the law of Christianity. So we today do not put false teachers to death, although, um, well, I won't say that, never mind. <laughs> Sometimes it would... Uh, clear up confusion. But it shows us, though, that God's heart, God is more concerned with, um, God is more concerned with someone that might die spiritually than he is with someone that's going to die physically. He goes, I'm much more concerned with the spiritual side of things. And if you have people muddying the waters, if you have people leading people astray, he says, I don't like it. And this is something, honestly, that I struggle with every Friday and Saturday when I drive by the post office. Because outside our post office here, every Friday and Saturday, our people set up with their little board, and they're handing out their stuff. And they're, for the most part, the majority of people are just walking right past them. But all it takes is one person who's trying to seek truth, who... Uh, maybe was raised Christian, but then they kind of went off and now they're back and here's someone and they're claiming uh, to be a believer in Jesus and a true church or whatever. And all of a sudden they can get sucked into these traps and the Lord just goes, I, I don't like it. He takes it very seriously as he should because at the end of the day, the MO of these groups of people is that they're coming, their, 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 their message is that the the God of the Bible is, um, their message is that we have more to add to the God of the Bible. And um, God doesn't like that. We've already seen he doesn't want you to add to or take away from the, this Sunday when we look in Revelation chapter 22. Um, he'll address that as he closes up the book. He says, just leave my stuff alone, essentially. Don't be, don't be screwing with my words, he would say. Uh, verse number six, he says, if your brother or your if your brother or your son of your mother, which would be your brother, or your son or your daughter or the wife of your bosom or the friend who is as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eyes pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. Man, if your family, he says, if your brother or your sister or your son or your, even your wife or your, your really close friend who's close with your soul, he goes, if anyone who's close to you tries to even secretly pull you inside and say, 
well, how about we go check that out over there? Have you ever considered exploring this? He says, do not do it. God says, do not follow your family. He says, follow me. And this is important for us to realize because the loved ones in our lives carry a lot of weight in our decision making. But God goes, don't be deceived in this. Don't let them lead you astray. Verse 7, of, or I guess we read down to verse number uh, 9. He says, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be uh, first against him to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people. The practice back then, whether if it's in this context or if someone committed um, blasphemy or, or uh, broke one of these Levitical commandments, which the uh, punishment was stoning, whoever um, witnessed the crime or the accuser of the crime was the first to throw the stone. Now, this is very important for us to realize today because if you're going to say someone did something, you better be sure you know what you're talking about before you say it. That's the point back then because you're going to be the first one to cast the stone. And today, even in the church, that carries over that if you're going to say something about someone, you better be sure you know what you're talking about before you start opening up your mouth because it's going to cause a lot of problems if you, if you don't have the whole story or you're just running off of some whim or rumor that you've heard somewhere. So... That's kind of our application for today that we can learn from this. I find it funny, verse number 10, it says, and you shall stone him with stones. Well, you shall stone him. Lord, what shall we stone them with? Um, stones. Okay, thank you, right? He just throws that in there. You shall stone them with stones. Verse 11, so all of Israel shall hear and fear and um, not again do such wickedness, all this among you. Huh, you know, uh, Capital punishment can be effective. He goes, all of Israel, if they see this start to happen, they're going to hear and they're going to fear. And it's going to cause them to not want to do this stuff because they realize that this stuff results in consequences. That's one of the problems, again, with our society today is that we, we really lack on the, the consequence side of the stick. It's like, oh, you, yeah, our legal system is completely screwed up and you have people uh, that are sitting in jail um, that are going to live there for the rest of their lives until they die, living off taxpayer dollars. And again, if you got to be careful, but if it's 100% this guy's guilty and it's worthy of capital punishment, it's like God is okay with that stuff, especially in this Old Testament sense. And if our nation chose to follow that, there wouldn't be anything morally wrong with upholding those things, especially because they work really good as far as deterrence. If you see that, man, this guy... Uh, Hmm, <laughs> you know, I'm not a fan of, and uh, radical Muslim countries do this, and I don't think it's the best thing, but uh, if you steal something, and you, that guy steals something, and he gets his hand chopped off, and you're thinking about stealing something, and then you look at the guy with no hand, you're going to think twice before you steal something. So it's kind of like, okay. Verse 12, it says, you, if you hear someone in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives you, to dwell in saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of the city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then you shall inquire and search out and ask diligently, and if it is so, indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you. So he goes, if you hear word that in a neighboring city they're, they're practicing paganism, they're going after another god, First thing you need to do is you need to, meet, you need to be sure that story's straight. He says, investigate a little bit. Again, before you get all excited to start throwing stones and executing people, be sure you understand what you're getting in. Again, this is a great word for us as Christians today. Before you get all excited to jump on the back of another Christian and start beating them up the head with the Bible, be sure you actually understand the situation because most of the time you don't. So he says, do your homework. Figure out what's going on. Verse 14, then... You shall inquire. You shall search out diligently. Ask if it is indeed true uh, and certain that such an abomination was committed among you. You shall surely strike uh, the inhabitants of the city with the edge of the sword and utterly destroy him and all of its uh, livestock with the edge of the sword. He goes, if it does turn out to be true what you heard, well, then you go through with the procedure and that's getting rid of it. Verse number uh, 16, he says, And you shall gather all of its plunder in the middle of the street and completely burn it with fire uh, in the city and its plunder for the Lord your God, uh, and it shall be a heap forever. 
and it shall not be built uh, again. Now, that word heap that's used there in verse number 16 is interesting. In the uh, Hebrew, it's the word tell. And when you go to Israel today, they have all of these um, tell Dan. It's a heap. It's ruins. Tell Dan is the, the city of Dan, the ruins of Dan. Tel Aviv, it's the, the heap of Tel Aviv, the heap of Div, the ruins, the heap of Adiv. Um, and I just find that interesting. Verse 17 says, None of the uh, accused things shall remain in your hand uh, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you just as he swore to your fathers. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments, which I commanded you today to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. Again, he just reminds them the importance of uh, being obedient. And um, But notice there, as he wraps up this section, you hear a rumor about something that's going on that's contrary to my word. Before you just react, do your research. But he goes, if you find out that thing is true, then you deal with it with how I've told you to deal with it. Now, here's one of the things Here's one of the balances that we have to try to balance as the church, as Christians. Um, there's churches out there that are just like so um, legalistic that I wouldn't dare step foot in them. And there's other ones that are so uh, loosey-goosey that they don't have any sort of uh, tangibleness of truth to them at all. So it's important for us to know the Word of God. And the Word of God in the New Testament has... Um, some pretty clear standards. And when the Lord puts us in a situation personally with another person, and we see that they are um, dealing with a thing, they're choosing a lifestyle that is contrary to with what God has laid out, and they're claiming to be a follower of God, part of it is our responsibility, out of love, to have those tough conversations. Sometimes we have to have that. So the balance is you can't be the sin sniffer that's trying to beat up people all the time. But when God really has you in a situation to get someone's attention, then you need to have a, enough oomph to sit down with them and say, look, man, I, I see that you're choosing to live this way and you're claiming to be uh, a follower of Jesus. And kind of here's what the Bible says about it. So uh, how can I help you through this or, or what do you need and walk them through it? Don't just beat them up and walk away. Uh, but we're called to do that as Christians. And again, that's a very fine line to walk. And I even don't even like, honestly, I don't even like talking about it because I've seen the abuse on the other side so hard. I'd much rather just be on the grace side. But at the end of the day, we as Christians, are called to be proclaimers of truth, and sometimes we have to speak that into the lives of our brothers and sisters, but it's got to always, always, always be out of love, and you got to always, 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 always know the situation that you're dealing with before you get into it, because the last thing you want to do is start dealing with stuff you don't know anything about. So anyway, there's Deuteronomy chapters 12 and 13, dealing with places of worship, false prophets. Keep an eye out for it. I'm very weary about that stuff, um, even in our own church. We have um, people that, um, we have some skilled people, and I've had people even in the not so distant past that as far as ability and even calling could probably teach very well, and they've let me know that, Hagen, if you ever, um, you know, need a, a break or whatever, um, let me know and I'd love to fill in for you. And I go, okay, that's great. And to me, that's where that should end. But I've had people in my past push it, push it, and literally almost tell me that they're going to teach. And that is a huge red flag, and I pump the brakes, and I go, that's not going to happen. Because you might be the most loving guy in the world, but anyone that's pushing to try to get an audience is a red flag to me. So just for your guys' sake, uh, on my end as your pastor, I, and I'm not a controlling guy, but the one thing I am extremely controlling about is what comes out of here to you guys. And, and I'd rather err on the side of uh, holding on tight to that. And even if that means you see a lot of me and not a lot of guest teachers, that's okay because I would hate to have someone come up in front of a pulpit that I'm responsible for and teach something that's contrary to this. So anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this evening. Um, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Um, and we looked at some, some interesting stuff tonight. Um, Lord, thank you that we are living in a time uh, where we do not have to worship you on a mountain, Lord, or in Jerusalem. 
but Lord, we worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we do that through your son, Jesus. Lord, Jesus is the, the, the place, Lord, that you've set up for us to be the place to worship. And Lord, thank you for that. Um, Lord, he's the, the only way, as we see in John chapter 14, verse 6. And uh, our response to that shouldn't be, why is there only one way? Our response should be, praise God, there is a way. So Lord, thank you that you have made a way for us to approach you. Even in our sinfulness, Lord, you've made a way for us to be uh, redeemed, to be reconciled back to you, uh, and that we're able to now approach you, as the Bible says, that we can actually come boldly before your throne of grace, Lord, not because we're great, uh, but because uh, we're clothed in your righteousness, Jesus. Um, Lord, help us as people, uh, as your church, as believers, just have a real spirit of discernment when it comes to false teachers. Lord, they exist on the TV today. They exist on radio, on the internet, on YouTube, uh, books. Uh, they can come to our house. Lord, there's so many ways that the devil tries to spin the truth. And Lord, I pray that we would be people that know your word. And if they uh, try to come and, and do that to us, Lord, that we would... Um, um, Lord, we wouldn't get sucked into uh, their plea to follow other gods. And Lord, that we would be equipped enough to be able to, um, to point out where they're erring. Um, Lord, thank you that you that your word is truth, that you've given it to us, that you've preserved it. That, um, Lord, we don't have to search for uh, something greater than what's been revealed. Lord, what you've given us is um, all that requires to life and godliness. And anyone that comes along that's trying to add to what you've given, Lord, it's, uh, it's not good, Lord. It's a red flag. So just help us keep that in mind. Um, Lord, continue to uh, work through us and speak uh, to us. Um, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Again, Lord, just for the beautiful days you've blessed us with. Um, just keep us safe tonight um, as we go home. And um, Lord, as we just think of you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.